Good day everyone, I am Sir Jarison Chua and today I will be presenting my report on pedagogical theory and practice called Cognitive Theory of Multimedia Learning by Richard Mayer. So before we proceed, let's just have this activity. So if you were given the chance to choose between example number one and example number two, which would you choose? So for me, I would rather choose example number one. It's because it's simpler, it uses bullets, and it maximizes the use of white space. Compared to example number two, where it uses several images, and the uh, color does not really suit well with the actual background of the slide. For the introduction of CTML, it says here that we can learn more deeply from words and pictures together than from just words alone. I guess we can relate to this as teachers because in our slides, we tend to use images, graphics, and other videos to really make our discussion more dynamic. And if it's just words alone with our presentation, it tends to get too boring at times. This is also true in choosing textbooks. So students would prefer textbooks that has diagrams and pictures rather than text alone. So in order for us to really apply CTML in our PowerPoints, we can use some Prezi or videos integrated in our lectures. But there is a caution that all uses of multimedia are not equally effective for the learner. So it's important for us to really contextualize it in our lesson. So there is actually two channels that is integrated in our CTML and those two channels includes our eyes and our ears. So for the first channel, these are visually represented materials such as pictures, videos, charts, or printed words. And we have auditory materials such as spoken words in a narration and other nonverbal sounds. So these two channels is also known as your sensory memory. So through this sensory memory, we will be having some information to place in our working memory, such as images being captured and words are being logged in our brain. In our working memory, we tend to choose relevant images or words to remember and work with. So it's important for us when discussing that we provide them key points or summary of the discussion. Learner integrates the visual model and auditory model together with their prior knowledge and experiences. So also, the learners needs to relate to what we are talking for them to really absorb what we are talking about. So we have the visual and auditory materials, which has now been combined in a functional way. The new knowledge can move into long-term memory. So this is presented through this model. So in our CTML, as you can see here, we have here the multimedia presentation through words and pictures. And this is absorbed through our senses which is our sensory memory through the ears and eyes. For pictures, it moves through the eyes. For words, we have the ears and eyes as well. So as you can see here, selected words and selected images will now move to our sensory memory in which it was, will be organized into words and images. And this will be associated with both of the multimedia presentations such as the sound and images. Aside from that, this will be moved to verbal model and we have picture model that will be used in accordance to the prior knowledge of the students from the long-term memory. This is associating this prior knowledge to the new knowledge for them to really absorb the lesson that we are talking about. So how can we effectively use multimedia in our instruction? So Richard Mayer presented two advice. The first advice is there is limited capacity assumption where students choose what pieces of information they need to pay attention to. And as teachers, we need to not overwhelm them with our information that is too long because students' attention span nowadays is shorter. And there is actually a study that students' attention is now linked to the teachers and not the teaching format. So even if the material is really interesting, if presented in a dull or dry fashion, it will not be just as effective as we want it to be. 
So there is also a need for us to limit the number of printed words in our presentation and make simpler use of pictures and clear spoken narration as well. The second assumption is what we call active processing assumption in which the learner has to be actively engaged for them to really learn. It creates a mental representation or model and using presentation materials, it's really easy to be understandable in a structure that guides the learner in making a mental model. So for us teachers, it's really important to really enhance our teaching skills through these two assumptions as well as to provide satisfying lecture experience to our students. There is also Mayer's five model structures, which can be used to improve our teaching technique. So the first one is what we call process structure. So this is the explanation for how a system works and can be represented as a cause and effect chain. So this is similar on our presentation a while ago on the CTML model from the information that we get from our senses to the new knowledge. Another example is the visual representation of the two channels in processing our information. Another structure or model that we can use is what we call the comparison structure, which we compare multiple points between two or more items and is often represented as a matrix. So you can use the advantages and disadvantages matrix or a rubric matrix as well. Another one, we can also use generalization structure, which organizes our main idea and supporting details, which can be represented as a branching tree. So deductive method from general going to the specific items. So in our discussions, we can also use this. Another one is what we call our enumeration structure, which is a collection of items that can be usually represented in the list because items in this collection are equal. So you may use bullets, checklist, and others. So um, you may also integrate here the key terms or a summary of the discussion using enumeration structure. And the last one is what we call the classification structure in which sets and subsets can be represented as hierarchy. So from the top going to the bottom item. So that is the five model structure of Mayer. So here is the example of Mayer's multimedia presentation of how lightning is being formed. So on the left image, there is a very simple visual animation that shows horizontal squiggly lines that represent cool air. On the center image, there is a vertical squiggly lines for warm air that rises. And on the third image, a vertical squeaky lines pointing into the cloud to show that there is a formation of an actual cloud. And through that clouds, lightning can be formed. So according to Mayer CTML, our use of pictures and words in instruction are very important and very impactful. So another theory that is associated with CTML is what we call cognitive load theory by John Sweller. So this is an instructional design theory for us to know the way we process information. According to this, working memory is able to hold a small amount of information and we need to avoid overloading it to maximize learning. So there are three aspects of cognitive load theory, which is the extraneous load, intrinsic load, and the germane load. With extraneous load, we need to narrow essential material and avoid needless animation in our presentations or putting irrelevant information in our lessons. Intrinsic load, we need to chunk our material and identify technical terms in advance. And for German load, we need to have a little bit of understanding of how motivation is being affected in our lessons and scaffold learning and pace materials appropriately. So here are the principles that can minimize extraneous load. The first one is what we call coherence principle, in which we can include graphics, text, and narration that really support our learning goals. Please don't use decorative images. It will distract your learners. As well as do not use background images, okay? Because they will have an impact of what you are discussing during your discussion. And use simple visuals. Another one is what we call signaling principle in which we can use arrows, animated arrows, 
highlights and other signals to draw our attention to what we are talking and to point out important information in our discussion. Next is what we call redundancy principle, where we deliver a narrated presentation, use graphics or text, but not both. Minimize the use of text during a narrated presentation as well, so that the students will not have overloaded information reading them and hearing them. Spatial contiguity principle allows you to place text in close proximity with your graphics, provide feedback close to the questions or answers, and also present directions on the same screen as the activity. Also, provide a information of that particular picture before beginning an animated graphic. Another one is what we call temporal contiguity principle, in which when you are recording, you need to time your narration appropriately to play along with your animations. Okay. Next, how we can manage intrinsic load. So segmenting principle is a way we need to break down log segments of materials into smaller pieces through chunking, or we can use bulleted items for this. Another way for intrinsic load is we have the pre-training principle in which we need to define your key terms before beginning a process-based presentation. And you need to ensure people know how to use tools before asking them to perform learning activities within them. Okay, so provide an overview first and then give them the task. And we also have here a principle that optimizes germane load. So we can use the multimedia principle in which we can use images to illustrate our key points or graphics as well. Use that all images enhance or clarify the meaning of what we are talking about because visual learners of the day needs to be presented with images rather than being purely decorative. And favor static images over animations because some may be distracted of using GIF or overloaded videos on your slides. So CTML is also actually connected with connectivism in the classroom. So in connectivism, this allows you to use different social media and maximizing its full potential through businesses, blogging, and others. Gamification in classroom using gamified assessments such as Kahoot, Quizzes, and others. And simulation activities for students. With connectivism, this also creates collaboration and empowers students and teachers to have good relationship in the classroom. There is actually criticism in the theory of CTML. This includes not taking account the stress and motivation of the students, which is an important factor to really understand how students learn. And it does not explicitly address non narrative audio, such as background music, because as mentioned a while ago, it, can, it may be distracting to some students, but some also needs to hear something to learn, okay? It's unclear how generalizable theory is because there are not enough studies on how this can be really effective on its implementation. For the synthesis of CTML, so it says here that when it comes to learning, the human mind is a dual channel. It has limited capacity, and active processing system is a must. Instructors should manage their learners' essential processing, optimizing their generative processing, minimize the extraneous processing through thoughtful construction of multimedia presentations. And these principles are most applicable when multimedia message describes processes. So that's all for today and thank you for listening. So here are my references on the CTML multimedia learning. Thank you and God bless.